6. The Grand Masters and the Underground Stream In the dossier's secrets, the following individuals are listed as successive Grand Masters of the Prière de Chaune or, to use the official term, not near, an old French word which means navigator or helmsman. Jean de Geysers 1188-1220 Marie de Saint Clair 1220-66 Guillaume de Geysers 1266-1307 Edouard de Bar 1307-36 Jean de Bar 1336-51 Jean de Saint Clair 1351-66 Blanche de Evreux 1366-98 Nicolas Flamel 1398-1418 René Danjou 1418-80 Yolande de Bar 1480-83 Sandro Filippi 1483 to 1510, Leonard da Vinci 1510 to 19, Canetable de Bourbon 1519 to 27, Ferdinand de Gonzague 1527 to 75, Louis de Nevers 1575 to 95, Robert Flood 1595 to 1637, J. Valentine Andrea 1637 to 54. Robert Boyle 1654 to 91 Isaac Newton 1691 to 1727 Charles Radcliffe 1727 to 46 Charles de Lorraine 1746 to 80 Maximilian de Lorraine 1780 to 1801 Charles Nodier 1801 to 44 Victor Hugo 1844 to 85 Claude Debussy 1885-1918 Jean Cocteau 1918 When we first saw this list, it immediately provoked our skepticism. On the one hand it includes a number of names which one would automatically expect to find on such a list names of famous individuals associated with the occult and esoteric. On the other hand it includes a number of illustrious and improbable names individuals whom, in certain cases, we could not imagine presiding over a secret society. At the same time, many of these latter names are precisely the kind that 20th century organizations have often attempted to appropriate for themselves, thus establishing a species of spurious pedigree. There are, for example, lists published by Amorque, the modern Rosicrucians based in California, which include virtually every important figure in Western history and culture whose values, even if only tangentially, happen to coincide with the order's own. An often haphazard overlap or convergence of attitudes is deliberately misconstrued as something tantamount to initiated membership. And thus one is told that Dante, Shakespeare, Goethe and innumerable others were Rosicrucians implying that they were card-carrying members who paid their dues regularly. Our initial attitude towards the above list was equally cynical. Again, there are the predictable names names associated with the occult and esoteric. Nicholas Flamel, for instance, is perhaps the most famous and well-documented of medieval alchemists. Robert Flood, 17th-century philosopher, was an exponent of hermetic thought and other arcane subjects. Johann Valentin Andrea, German contemporary of Flood, composed, among other things, some of the works which spawned the myth of the fabulous Christian Rosenkreuz. And there are also names like Leonardo da Vinci and Sandro Filippi, who is better known as Botticelli. There are names of distinguished scientists, like Robert Boyle and Sir Isaac Newton. During the last two centuries the Prière de Chaune's Grand Masters are alleged to have included such important literary and cultural figures as Victor Hugo, Claude Debussy and Jean Cocteau. By including such names, the list in the dossier's secrets could not but appear suspect. It was almost inconceivable that some of the individuals cited had presided over a secret society, and still more, a secret society devoted to occult and esoteric interests. Boyle and Newton, for example, are hardly names that people in the 20th century associate with the occult. And esoteric. And though Hugo, Debussy and Cocteau were immersed in such matters, they would seem to be too well known, too well researched and documented, to have exercised a grand mastership over a secret order. Not, at any rate, without some word of it somehow leaking out. On the other hand the distinguished names are not the only names on the list. Most of the other names belong to high-ranking European nobles, many of whom are extremely obscure unfamiliar not only to the general reader, but even to the professional historian. 
There is Guillaume de Geysers, for instance, who in 1306 is said to have organized the Prieur de Chaune into a hermetic Freemasonry. And there is Guillaume's grandfather, Jean de Geysers, who is said to have been Chaune's first independent Grand Master, assuming his position after the cutting of the elm and the separation from the temple in 1188. There is no question that Jean de Geysers existed historically. He was born in 1133 and died in 1220. He is mentioned in charters and was at least nominal lord of the famous fortress in Normandy where meetings traditionally convened between English and French kings took place, as did the cutting of the elm in 1188. Jean seems to have been an extremely powerful and wealthy landowner and, until 1193, a vassal of the King of England. He is also known to have possessed property in England and Sussex, and the manor of Titchfield in Hampshire. According to the dossier's secrets, he met Thomas of Becket at Geysers in 1169 though there is no indication of the purpose of this meeting. We were able to confirm that Becket was indeed at Geysers in 1169, 3, and it is therefore probable that he had some contact with the lord of the fortress, but we could find no record of any actual encounter between the two men. In short, Jean de Geysers, apart from a few bland details, proved virtually untraceable. He seemed to have left no mark whatever on history, save his existence and his title. We could find no indication of what he did what might have constituted his claim to fame, or have warranted his assumption of Shaun's grand mastership. If the list of Shaun's purported grand masters was authentic, what, we wondered, did Jean do to earn his place on it? And if the list were a latter-day fabrication, why should someone so obscure be included at all? There seemed to us only one possible explanation, which did not really explain very much in fact. Like the other aristocratic names on the list of Shaun's grand masters, Jean de Geysers appeared in the complicated genealogies which figured elsewhere in the Prier documents. Together with those other elusive nobles, he apparently belonged to the same dense forest of family trees ultimately descended, supposedly, from the Merovingian dynasty. It thus seemed evident to us that the Prieur de Chaune to a significant extent, at least was a domestic affair. In some way the order appeared to be intimately associated with a bloodline and a lineage. And it was their connection with this bloodline or lineage that perhaps accounted for the various titled names on the list of Grand Masters. From the list quoted above, it would seem that Chaune's Grand Mastership has recurrently shifted between two essentially distinct groups of individuals. On the one hand there are the figures of monumental stature, who through esoterica, the arts or sciences have produced some impact on Western tradition, history and culture. On the other hand, there are members of a specific and interlinked network of families noble, and sometimes royal. In some degree this curious juxtaposition imparted plausibility to the list. If one merely wished to concoct a pedigree, there would be no point in including so many unknown or long-forgotten aristocrats. There would be no point, for instance, in including a man like Charles de Lorraine Austrian Field Marshal in the 18th century, brother-in-law to the Empress Maria Theresa, who proved himself signally inept on the battlefield and was trounced in one engagement after another by Frederick the Great of Prussia. In this respect, at least, the Prieur de Chaun would seem to be both modest and realistic. It does not claim to have functioned under the auspices of unqualified geniuses, superhuman masters, illumined initiates, saints, sages or immortals. On the contrary, it acknowledges its grand masters to have been fallible human beings, a representative cross-section of humanity a few geniuses, a few notables, a few average specimens, a few non-entities, even a few fools. Why, we could not but wonder, would a forged or fabricated list include such a spectrum? If one wishes to contrive a list of grand masters, why not make all the names on it illustrious? If one wishes to concoct a pedigree which includes Leonardo, Newton and Victor Hugo, why not also include Dante, Michelangelo, Goethe and Tolstoy instead of obscure people like Edouard de Barre and Maximilien de Lorraine? Why, moreover, were there so many lesser lights on the list? Why a relatively minor writer like Charles Notier, rather than contemporaries like Byron or Pushkin? Why an apparent eccentric like Cocteau rather than men of such international prestige as André Gide or Albert Camus? And why the omission of individuals like Poussin, whose connection with the mystery had already been established? 
Such questions nagged at us and argued that the list warranted consideration before we dismissed it as an errant fraud. We therefore embarked on a lengthy and detailed study of the alleged Grand Masters their biographies, activities, and accomplishments. In conducting this study we tried, as far as we could, to subject each name on the list to certain critical questions. 1. Was there any personal contact, direct or indirect, between each alleged Grand Master, his immediate predecessor and immediate successor? 2. Was there any affiliation, by blood or otherwise, between each alleged Grand Master and the families who figured in the genealogies of the prior documents with any of the families of purported Merovingian descent, and especially the Ducal House of Lorraine? 3. Was each alleged Grand Master in any way connected with Renessal Chateau, Geysers, Steeny, St. Sulpice, or any of the other sites that had recurred in the course of our previous investigation? 4. If Shaun defined itself as a hermetic Freemasonry, did each alleged Grand Master display a predisposition towards hermetic thought or an involvement with secret societies? Although information on the alleged Grand Masters before 1400 was difficult, sometimes impossible to obtain, our investigation of the later figures yields some astonishing results and consistency. Many of them were associated, in one way or another, with one or more of the sites that seemed to be relevant. Ren Le Chateau, Geysers, Steeny, or Saint Sulpice. Most of the names on the list were either allied by blood to the House of Lorraine or associated with it in some other fashion. Even Robert Flood, for example, served as tutor to the sons of the Duke of Lorraine. From Nicholas Flamel on, every name on the list, without exception, was steeped in hermetic thought and often also associated with secret societies, even men whom one would not readily associate with such things, like Boyle and Newton. And with only one exception, each alleged Grand Master had some contact sometimes direct, sometimes through close mutual friends with those who preceded and succeeded him. As far as we could determine, there was only one apparent break in the chain. And even this which seems to have occurred around the French Revolution, between Maximilian of Lorraine and Charles Notier is not by any means conclusive. In the context of this chapter it is not feasible to discuss each alleged Grand Master in detail. Some of the more obscure figures assume significance only against the background of a given age, and to explain this significance fully would entail lengthy digressions into forgotten byways of history. In the case of the more famous names, it would be impossible to do them justice in a few pages. In consequence the relevant biographical material on the alleged Grand Masters and the connections between them have been consigned to an appendix, CPP, 441-65. The present chapter will dwell on broader social and cultural developments, in which a succession of alleged Grand Masters played a collective part. It was in such social and cultural developments that our research seemed to yield a discernible trace of the Prior de Chaun's hand. René d'Anjou Although little known today, René d'Anjou Good King René as he was known was one of the most important figures in European culture during the years immediately preceding the Renaissance. Born in 1408, during his life he came to hold an awesome array of titles. Among the most important were Count of Bar, Count of Provence, Count of Piedmont, Count of Guise, Duke of Calabria, Duke of Anjou, Duke of Lorraine, King of Hungary, King of Naples and Sicily, King of Aragon, Valencia, Majorca and Sardinia and, perhaps most resonant of all, King of Jerusalem. This last was, of course, purely titular. Nevertheless it invoked a continuity extending back to Godfroy de Bouillon and was acknowledged by other European potentates. One of René's daughters, Marguerite d'Anjou, in 1445 married Henry VI of England and played a prominent role in the Wars of the Roses. In its earlier phases René d'Anjou's career seems to have been in some obscure way associated with that of Jean d'Arc. As far as is known, Jean was born in the town of Domremy, in the Duchy of Bar, making her René's subject. She first impressed herself on history in 1429, when she appeared at the fortress of Vaucouleurs, a few miles up the Meuse from Domremy. Presenting herself to the commandant of the fortress, she announced her divine mission to save France from the English invaders and ensure that the Dauphin, subsequently Charles VII, was crowned king. In order to perform this mission, she would have had to join the Dauphin at his court at Chinon, on the Loire, far to the southwest. But she did not request a passage to Chinon of the commandant at Vaucouleurs, she requested a special audience. 
with the Duke of Lorraine René's father-in-law and great-uncle. In deference to her request, Jean was granted an audience with the Duke at his capital in Nancy. When she arrived there, René d'Anjou is known to have been present. And when the Duke of Lorraine asked her what she wished, she replied explicitly, in words that have constantly perplexed historians, your son, in law, a horse and some good men to take me into France. Both at the time and later, speculation was rife about the nature of Rene's connection with Jean. According to some sources, probably inaccurate, the two were lovers. But the fact remains that they knew each other, and that Rene was present when Jean first embarked on her mission. Moreover, contemporary chroniclers maintain that when Jean departed for the Dauphin's court at Chinon, René accompanied her. And not only that. The same chroniclers assert that René was actually present at her side during the Siege of Orleans. In the centuries that followed a systematic attempt seems to have been made to expunge all trace of René's possible role in Jean's life. Yet René's later biographers cannot account for his whereabouts or activities between 1429 and 1431 the apex of Jean's career. It is usually and tacitly assumed that he was vegetating at the ducal court in Nancy, but there is no evidence to support this assumption. Circumstances argue that René did accompany Jean to Chinon. For if there was any one dominant personality at Chinon at the time, that personality was Iolandi Danju. It was Iolandi who provided the febrile, weak-willed dauphin with incessant transfusions of morale. It was Iolandi who inexplicably appointed herself Jean's official patroness and sponsor. It was Iolandi who overcame the court's resistance to the visionary girl and obtained authorization for her to accompany the army to Orleans. It was Iolandi who convinced the dauphin that Jean might indeed be the savior she claimed to be. It was Iolandi who contrived the Dauphin's marriage to her own daughter. And Iolandi was Rene Danjou's mother. As we studied these details, we became increasingly convinced, like many modern historians, that something was being enacted behind the scenes some intricate, high-level intrigue, or audacious design. The more we examined it, the more Jean d'Arc's meteoric career began to suggest a put-up job as if someone, exploiting popular legends of a virgin from Lorraine and playing ingeniously on mass psychology, had engineered and orchestrated the Maid of Orleans's so-called mission. This did not, of course, presuppose the existence of a secret society. But it rendered the existence of such a society decidedly more plausible. And if such a society did exist, the man presiding over it might well have been René d'Anjou. René and the theme of Arcadia. If René was associated with Jean d'Arc, his later career, for the most part, was distinctly less bellicose. Unlike many of his contemporaries, René was less a warrior than a courtier. In this respect he was misplaced in his own age, he was, in short, a man ahead of his time, anticipating the cultured Italian princes of the Renaissance. An extremely literate person, he wrote prolifically and illuminated his own books. He composed poetry and mystical allegories, as well as compendiums of tournament rules. He sought to promote the advancement of knowledge, and at one time employed Christopher Columbus. He was steeped in esoteric tradition and his court included a Jewish astrologer, Kabbalist and physician known as Jean de Saint Remy. According to a number of accounts, Jean de Saint Remy was the grandfather of Nostradamus, the famous 16th century prophet who was also to figure in our story. René's interests included chivalry and the Arthurian and Grail romances. Indeed he seems to have had a particular preoccupation with the Grail. He is said to have taken great pride in a magnificent cup of red porphyry, which, he asserted, had been used at the wedding at Cana. He had obtained it, he claimed, at Marseilles where the Magdalene, according to tradition, landed with the Grail. Other chroniclers speak of a cup in René's possession perhaps the same one which bore a mysterious inscription incised into the rim, Ca bien bura du voira. Ca bura tout d'un baline voira du et la madeleine. He who drinks well will see God. He who quaffs at a single draft will see God and the Magdalene. The Rosicrucian manifestos, it would not be inaccurate to regard René d'Anjou as a major impetus behind the phenomenon now called the Renaissance. By virtue of his numerous Italian possessions he spent some years in Italy, and through his intimate friendship with the ruling Sforza family of Milan he established contact with the Medici of Florence. 
There is good reason to believe that it was largely René's influence which prompted Cosimo de' Medici to embark on a series of ambitious projects projects destined to transform Western civilization. In 1439, while René was resident in Italy, Cosimo de' Medici began sending his agents all over the world in quest of ancient manuscripts. Then, in 1444, Cosimo founded Europe's first public library, the Library of San Marco, and thus began to challenge the church's long monopoly of learning. At Cosimo's express commission, the corpus of Platonic, Neoplatonic, Pythagorean, Gnostic and Hermetic thought found its way into translation for the first time and became readily accessible. Cosimo also instructed the University of Florence to begin teaching Greek, for the first time in Europe for some 700 years. And he undertook to create an academy of Pythagorean and Platonic studies. Cosimo's academy quickly generated a multitude of similar institutions throughout the Italian peninsula, which became bastions of Western esoteric tradition. And from them the high culture of the Renaissance began to blossom. René d'Anjou not only contributed in some measure to the formation of the academies, but also seems to have conferred upon them one of their favorite symbolic themes that of Arcadia. Certainly it is in René's own career that the motif of Arcadia appears to have made its debut in post-Christian Western culture. In 1449, for example, at his court of Tarascon, René staged a series of pas d'armes curious hybrid amalgams of tournament and mask, in which knights tilted against each other and, at the same time, performed a species of drama or play. One of René's most famous pas d'armes was called the pas d'armes of the shepherdess. Played by his mistress at the time, the shepherdess was an explicitly Arcadian figure, embodying both romantic and philosophical attributes. She presided over a tourney in which knights assumed allegorical identities representing conflicting values and ideas. The event was a singular fusion of the pastoral Arcadian romance with the pageantry of the round table and the mysteries of the Holy Grail. Arcadia figures elsewhere in René's work as well. It is frequently denoted by a fountain or a tombstone, both of which are associated with an underground stream. This stream is usually equated with the river Alpheus, the central river in the actual geographical Arcadia in Greece, which flows underground and is said to surface again at the fountain of Arethusa in Sicily. From the most remote antiquity to Coleridge's Kubla Khan, the river Alpheus has been deemed sacred. Its very name derives from the same root as the Greek word alpha, meaning first or source. For René, the motif of an underground stream seems to have been extremely rich in symbolic and allegorical resonances. Among other things, it would appear to connote the underground esoteric tradition of Pythagorean, Gnostic, Kabbalistic, and Hermetic thought. But it might also connote something more than a general corpus of teachings, perhaps some very specific factual. Information is secret of some sort, transmitted in clandestine fashion from generation to generation. And it might connote an unacknowledged and thus subterranean bloodline. In the Italian academies the image of the underground stream appears to have been invested with all these levels of meaning. And it recurs consistently so much so, indeed, that the academies themselves have often been labeled Arcadian. Thus, in 1502, a major work was published, a long poem entitled Arcadia, by Jacopo Sanazzaro and René d'Anjou's Italian entourage of some years before included one Jacques Sanazer, probably the poet's father. In 1553 Sanazzaro's poem was translated into French. It was dedicated, interestingly enough, to the Cardinal of Lenincourt ancestor of the 20th century Count of Lenincourt who compiled the genealogies in the prior documents. During the 16th century Arcadia and the underground stream became a prominent cultural fashion. In England they inspired Sir Philip Sidney's most important work, Arcadia. In Italy they inspired such illustrious figures as Torquato Tasso whose masterpiece, Jerusalem Delivered, deals with the capture of the holy city by Godfroy de Bouillon. By the 17th century the motif of Arcadia had culminated in Nicolas Poussin and Les Burgers d'Arcady. The more we explored the matter, the more apparent it became that something a tradition of some sort, a hierarchy of values or attitudes, perhaps a specific body of information was constantly being intimated by the underground stream. This image seems to have assumed obsessive proportions in the minds of certain eminent political families of the period all of whom, directly or indirectly, 
figure in the genealogies of the prior documents. And the families in question seem to have transmitted the image to their protégés in the arts. From René d'Anjou, something seems to have passed to the Medici, the Sforza, the Este, and the Gonzaga the last of whom, according to the prior documents, provided Schaun with two grand masters, Ferrante de Gonzaga and Louis de Gonzaga, Duke of Nevers. From them it appears to have found its way into the work of the epoch's most illustrious poets and painters, including Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci. The Rosicrucian Manifestos A somewhat similar dissemination of ideas occurred in the 17th century, first in Germany, then spreading to England. In 1614 the first of the so-called Rosicrucian Manifestos appeared, followed by a second tract a year later. These manifestos created a furor at the time, provoking fulminations from the Church and the Jesuits, and electing fervently enthusiastic support from liberal factions in Protestant Europe. Among the most eloquent and influential exponents of Rosicrucian thought was Robert Flood, who is listed as the Prier de Chaun's 16th Grand Master, presiding between 1595 and 1637. Among other things, the Rosicrucian manifestos promulgated the story of the legendary Christian Rosenkreutz. They purported to issue from a secret, invisible confraternity of initiates in Germany and France. They promised a transformation of the world and of human knowledge in accordance with esoteric, hermetic principles that underground stream which had flowed from René d'Anjou through the Renaissance. A new epoch of spiritual freedom was heralded, an epoch in which man would liberate himself from his former. Shackles would unlock hitherto dormant secrets of nature, and would govern his own destiny in accord with harmonious, all-pervading universal and cosmic laws. At the same time, the manifestos were highly inflammatory politically, fiercely attacking the Catholic Church and the old Holy Roman Empire. These manifestos are now generally believed to have been written by a German theologian and esotericist, Johann Valentin Andrea, listed as Grand Master of the Prior de Schaun after Robert Flood. If they were not written by Andrea, they were certainly written by one or more of his associates. In 1616 a third Rosicrucian tract appeared, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Like the two previous works, The Chemical Wedding was originally of anonymous authorship, but Andrea himself later confessed to having composed it as a joke or comedy. The Chemical Wedding is a complex hermetic allegory, which subsequently influenced such works as Goethe's Faust. As Francis Yates has demonstrated, it contains unmistakable echoes of the English esotericist, John Dee, who also influenced Robert Flood. Andrea's work also evokes resonances of the Grail romances and of the Knights Templar Christian Rosenkreutz, for instance, is said to wear a white tunic with a red cross on the shoulder. In the course of the narrative a play is performed an allegory within an allegory. This play involves a princess of unspecified royal lineage, whose rightful domains have been usurped by the Moors and who is washed ashore in a wooden chest. The rest of the play deals with her vicissitudes and her marriage to a prince who will help her regain her heritage. Our research reveal the sordid second and third hand links between Andrea and the families whose genealogies figure in the prior documents. We discovered no first hand or direct links however, except perhaps for Frederick, Elector Palatine of the Rhine. Frederick was the nephew of an important French Protestant leader, Henri de la Tour d'Auvergne, Viscount of Turin and Duke of Bouillon Godfroy de Bouillon's old title. Henri was also associated with the Longueville family, which figured prominently in both the prior documents and our own inquiry. And in 1591 he had taken great trouble to acquire the town of Steeny. In 1613 Frederick of the Palatinate had married Elizabeth Stuart, daughter of James I of England, granddaughter of Mary Queen of Scots and great-granddaughter of Marie de Guise and Guise was the cadet branch of the House of Lorraine. Marie de Guise, a century before, had been married to the Duke of Longueville and then, on his death, to James V of Scotland. This created a dynastic alliance between the houses of Stuart and Lorraine. In consequence the Stuarts began to figure, if only peripherally, in the genealogies of the prior documents, and Andrea, as well as the three alleged grand masters who followed him, displayed varying degrees of interest in the Scottish royal house. During this period the House of Lorraine was, to a significant degree, in eclipse. If Shaun was a coherent and active order at the time, 
It might therefore have transferred its allegiance at least partially and temporarily to the decidedly more influential Stuarts. In any case Frederick of the Palatinate, after his marriage to Elizabeth Stuart, established an esoterically oriented court at his capital of Heidelberg. As Francis Yates writes, a culture was forming in the Palatinate which came straight out of the Renaissance but with more recent trends added, a culture which may be defined by the adjective Rosicrucian. The prince around whom these deep currents were swirling was Friedrich, Elector Palatine, and their exponents were hoping for a politico-religious expression of their aims. The Frederickian movement was an attempt to give those currents politico-religious expression, to realize the ideal of hermetic reform centered on a real prince. It created a culture, a Rosicrucian state with its court centered on Heidelberg. In short the anonymous Rosicrucians and their sympathizers seem to have invested Frederick with a sense of mission, both spiritual and political. And Frederick seems to have readily accepted the role imposed upon him, together with the hopes and expectations it entailed. Thus, in 1618 he accepted the crown of Bohemia, offered him by that country's rebellious nobles. In doing so he incurred the wrath of the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire and precipitated the chaos of the Thirty Years War. Within two years he and Elizabeth had been driven into exile in Holland, and Heidelberg was overrun by Catholic troops. And for the ensuing quarter of a century Germany became the major battleground for the most bitter, bloody, and costly conflict in European history before the 20th century a conflict in which the church almost managed to reimpose the hegemony she had enjoyed during the Middle Ages. Amidst the turmoil raging around him, Andrea created a network of more or less secret societies known as the Christian Unions. According to Andrea's blueprint, each society was headed by an anonymous prince, assisted by twelve others divided into groups of three each of whom was to be a specialist in a given sphere of study. The original purpose of the Christian unions was to preserve threatened knowledge especially the most recent scientific advances, many of which the church deemed heretical. At the same time, however, the Christian unions also functioned as a refuge for persons fleeing the Inquisition which accompanied the invading Catholic armies and was intent on rooting out all vestiges of Rosicrucian thought. Thus numerous scholars, scientists, philosophers and esotericists found a haven in Andrea's institutions. Through them many were smuggled to safety in England where Freemasonry was just beginning to coalesce. In some significant sense Andrea's Christian unions may have contributed to the organization of the Masonic Lodge system. Among the displaced Europeans finding their way to England were a number of Andrea's personal associates, Samuel Hartlib, for example, Johann Komensky, better known as Comenius, with whom Andrea maintained a continuing correspondence, Theodore Hack, who was also a personal friend of Elizabeth Stuart and maintained a correspondence with her, and Dr. John Wilkins, formerly personal chaplain to the son of Frederick of the Palatinate and subsequently Bishop of Chester. Once in England, these men became closely associated with Masonic circles. They were intimate with Robert Moray, for instance, whose induction into a Masonic lodge in 1641 is one of the earliest on record, with Elias Ashmole, antiquarian and expert on chivalric orders, who was inducted in 1646, with the young but precocious Robert Boyle who, though not himself a Freemason, was a member of another, more elusive secret society. There is no concrete evidence that this secret society was the Prier de Chaun, but Boyle, according to the Prier documents, succeeded Andrea as Chaun's Grand Master. During Cromwell's protectorate, these dynamic minds, both English and European, formed what Boyle in a deliberate echo of the Rosicrucian manifestos called an invisible college. And with the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, the invisible college became the Royal Society 12 with the Stuart ruler, Charles II, as its patron and sponsor. One could reasonably argue that the Royal Society itself, at least in its inception, was a quasi-Masonic institution derived, through Andrea's Christian unions, from the invisible Rosicrucian Brotherhood. But this was not to be the culmination of the underground stream. On the contrary, it was to flow from Boyle to Sir Isaac Newton, listed as Shawn's next Grand Master, and thence into the complex tributaries of 18th century Freemasonry. The Stuart Dynasty. According to the Prier documents, Newton was succeeded as Shawn's Grand Master by Charles Radcliffe. 
The name was hardly as resonant to us as Newton's, or Boyle's, or even Andrea's. Indeed, we were not at first certain who Charles Radcliffe was. As we began to research into him, however, he emerged as a figure of considerable, if subterranean, consequence in 18th century cultural history. Since the 16th century, the Radcliffes had been an influential Northumbrian family. In 1688, shortly before he was deposed, James II had created them Earls of Derwentwater. Charles Radcliffe himself was born in 1693. His mother was an illegitimate daughter of Charles II by his mistress, Maul Davies. Radcliffe was thus, on his mother's side, of royal blood a grandson of the next-to-last Stuart monarch. He was a cousin of Bonnie Prince Charlie and of George Lee, Earl of Lichfield another illegitimate grandson of Charles II. Not surprisingly, therefore, Radcliffe devoted much of his life to the Stuart cause. In 1715 this cause rested with the old pretender, James III, then in exile and residing at bar Duc, under the special protection of Duke of Lorraine. Radcliffe and his elder brother, James, both participated in the Scottish rebellion of that year. Both were captured and imprisoned, and James was executed. Charles, in the meantime, apparently aided by the Earl of Lichfield, made a dashing and unprecedented escape from Newgate Prison, and found refuge in the Jacobite ranks in France. In the years that followed he became personal secretary to the young pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie. In 1745 the latter landed in Scotland and embarked on his quixotic attempt to reinstate the Stuarts on the British throne. In the same year Radcliffe, en route to join him, was captured in a French ship off the Dogger Bank. A year later, in 1746, the young pretender was disastrously defeated at the Battle of Culloden Moor. A few months thereafter, Charles Radcliffe died beneath the headsman's axe at the Tower of London. During their stay in France the Stuarts had been deeply involved in the dissemination of Freemasonry. Indeed they are generally regarded as the source of the particular form of Freemasonry known as Scottish Rite. Scottish Rite Freemasonry introduced higher degrees than those offered by other Masonic systems at the time. It promised initiation into greater and more profound mysteries mysteries supposedly preserved and handed down in Scotland. It established more direct connections between Freemasonry and the various activities alchemy, Kabbalism and Hermetic thought, for instance which were regarded as Rosicrucian. And it elaborated not only on the antiquity, but also on the illustrious pedigree of the craft. It is probable that Scottish Rite Freemasonry was originally promulgated, if not indeed devised, by Charles Radcliffe. In any case Radcliffe, in 1725, is said to have founded the first Masonic Lodge on the continent, in Paris. During the same year, or perhaps in the year following, he seems to have been acknowledged Grand Master of all French lodges, and it is still cited as such a decade later, in 1736. The dissemination of 18th century Freemasonry owes more, ultimately, to Radcliffe than to any other man. This has not always been readily apparent because Radcliffe, especially after 1738, kept a relatively low profile. To a very significant degree, he seems to have worked through intermediaries and mouthpieces. The most important of these, and the most famous, was the enigmatic individual known as the Chevalier Andrew Ramsay. Ramsay was born in Scotland sometime during the 1680s. As a young man he was a member of a quasi-Masonic, quasi-Rosicrucian society called the Philadelphians. Among the other members of this society were at least two close friends of Isaac Newton. Ramsay himself regarded Newton with unmitigated reverence, deeming him a kind of high mystical initiate a man who had rediscovered and reconstructed the eternal truths concealed in the ancient mysteries. Ramsey had other links with Newton. He was associated with Jean de Saguliers, one of Newton's closest friends. In 1707 he studied mathematics under one Nicolas Fatio de Duillier, the most intimate of all Newton's companions. Like Newton, he displayed a sympathetic interest in the Camisards a sect of Cather-like heretics then suffering. Persecution in southern France, and a kind of cause celebre for Fatio de Duillier. By 1710 Ramsay was in Cambrai and on intimate terms with the mystical philosopher Fenelon, formerly cure of Saint Sulpice which, even at that time, was a bastion of rather questionable orthodoxy. It is not known precisely when Ramsay made Charles Radcliffe's acquaintance, 
but by the 1720s he was closely affiliated with the Jacobite cause. For a time he even served as Bonnie Prince Charlie's tutor. Despite his Jacobite connections, Ramsay returned to England in 1729 where notwithstanding an apparent lack of appropriate qualifications he was promptly admitted to the Royal Society. He also became a member of a rather more obscure institution called the Gentleman's Club of Spalding. This club included men like de Saguliers, Alexander Pope and, until his death in 1727, Isaac Newton. By 1730 Ramsay was back in France and increasingly active on behalf of Freemasonry. He is on record as having attended lodge meetings with a number of notable figures, including de Saguliers. And he received special patronage from the Tour d'Auvergne family, the Viscounts of Turin and Dukes of Bouillon who, three quarters of a century before, had been related to Frederick of the Palatinate. In Ramsay's time the Duke of Bouillon was a cousin of Bonnie Prince Charlie, and among the most prominent figures in Freemasonry. He conferred an estate and a townhouse on Ramsay, whom he also appointed tutor to his son. In 1737 Ramsay delivered his famous oration a lengthy disquisition on the history of Freemasonry, which subsequently became a seminal document for the craft. On the basis of this oration Ramsay became the preeminent Masonic spokesman of his age. Our research convinced us however, that the real voice behind Ramsay was that of Charles Radcliffe who presided over the lodge at which Ramsay delivered his discourse, and who appeared again, in 1743, as chief signatory at Ramsay's funeral. But if Radcliffe was the power behind Ramsay, it would seem to have been Ramsay who constituted the link between Radcliffe and Newton. Despite Radcliffe's premature death in 1746, the seeds he had sown in Europe continued to bear fruit. Early in the 1750s a new ambassador of Freemasonry appeared a German named Karl Gottlieb von Hund. Hund claimed to have been initiated in 1742 a year before Ramsay's death, for years before Radcliffe's. At his initiation, he claimed, he had been introduced to a new system of Freemasonry, confided to him by unknown superiors. These unknown superiors, Hund maintained, were closely associated with the Jacobite cause. Indeed, he even believed at first that the man who presided over his initiation was Bonnie Prince Charlie. And although this proved not to be the case, Hund remained convinced that the unidentified personage in question was intimately connected with the young pretender. It seems reasonable to suppose that the man who actually presided was Charles Radcliffe. The system of Freemasonry to which Hund was introduced a further extension of the Scottish Rite was subsequently called Strict Observance. Its name derived from the oath it demanded, an oath of unswerving, unquestioning obedience to the mysterious unknown superiors. And the basic tenet of the Strict Observance was that it had descended directly from the Knights Templar, some of whom had purportedly survived the purge of 1307 to 14 and perpetuated their order in Scotland. We were already familiar with this claim. On the basis of our own research we could allow it some truth. A contingent of Templars had allegedly fought on Robert Bruce's side at the Battle of Bannockburn. Because the papal bull dissolving the Templars was never promulgated in Scotland, the order was never officially suppressed there. And we ourselves had located what seemed to be a Templar graveyard in Argyllshire. The earliest of the stones in this graveyard dated from the 13th century, the later ones from the 18th. The earlier stones bore certain unique carvings and incised symbols identical to those found at known Templar preceptories in England and France. The later stones combined these symbols with specifically Masonic motifs, attesting thereby to some sort of fusion. It was thus not impossible, we concluded, that the order had indeed perpetuated itself in the trackless wilderness of medieval Argyle maintaining a clandestine existence, gradually secularizing itself and becoming associated with both Masonic guilds and the prevailing clan system. The pedigree Hund claimed for the strict observance did not, therefore, seem to us altogether improbable. To his own embarrassment and subsequent disgrace however, he was unable to elaborate further on his new system of Freemasonry. As a result his contemporaries dismissed him as a charlatan and accused him of having fabricated the story of his initiation, his meeting with unknown superiors, his mandate to disseminate the strict observance. To these charges Hund could only reply that his unknown superiors had inexplicably abandoned him. 
They had promised to contact him again and give him further instructions, he protested, but they had never done so. To the end of his life he affirmed his integrity, maintaining he had been deserted by his original sponsors who he insisted had actually existed. The more we considered Hun's assertions, the more plausible they sounded, and he appeared to have been a hapless victim not so much of deliberate betrayal as of circumstances beyond everyone's control. For according to his own account, Hunt had been initiated in 1742, when the Jacobites were still a powerful political force in continental affairs. By 1746 however, Radcliffe was dead. So were many of his colleagues, while others were in prison or exile as far away, in some cases, as North America. If Hun's unknown superiors failed to re-establish contact with their protege, the omission does not seem to have been voluntary. The fact that Hun was abandoned immediately after the collapse of the Jacobite cause would seem, if anything, to confirm his story. There is another fragment of evidence which lends credence not only to Hun's claims, but to the prior documents as well. This evidence is a list of Grand Masters of the Knights Templar, which Hun insisted he had obtained from his unknown superiors. On the basis of our own research, we had concluded that the list of Templar Grand Masters in the dossier's secrets was accurate so accurate, in fact, that it appeared to derive from inside information. Save for the spelling of a single surname, the list Hunt produced agreed with the one in the dossier's secret. In short, Hunt had somehow obtained a list of Templar Grand Masters more accurate than any other known at the time. Moreover, he obtained it when many documents on which we relied charters, deeds, proclamations were still sequestered in the Vatican and unobtainable. This would seem to confirm that Hun's story of unknown superiors was not a fabrication. It would also seem to indicate that those unknown superiors were extraordinarily knowledgeable about the order of the temple more knowledgeable than they could possibly have been without access to privileged sources. In any case, despite the charges leveled against him Hun was not left completely friendless. After the collapse of the Jacobite cause he found a sympathetic patron, and a close companion, in no less a person than the Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor at this time was Francois, Duke of Lorraine who, by his marriage to Maria Theresa of Austria in 1735, had linked the houses of Habsburg and Lorraine and inaugurated the Habsburg-Lorraine dynasty. And according to the prior documents, it was Francois's brother, Charles de Lorraine, who succeeded Radcliffe as Schaun's Grand Master. Francois was the first European prince to become a Mason and to publicize his Masonic affiliations. He was initiated in 1731 at the Hague a bastion of esoteric activity since Rosicrucian circles had installed themselves there during the Thirty Years' War. And the man who presided over Francois's initiation was Jean de Saguliers, intimate associate of Newton, Ramsey and Radcliffe. Shortly after his initiation moreover, Francois embarked for a lengthy stay in England. Here he became a member of that innocuous-sounding institution, the Gentleman's Club of Spalding. In the years that followed, François de Lorraine was probably more responsible than any other European potentate for the spread of Freemasonry. His court at Vienna became, in a sense, Europe's Masonic capital, and a center for a broad spectrum of other esoteric interests as well. François himself was a practicing alchemist, with an alchemical laboratory in the Imperial Palace, the Hofburg. On the death of the last Medici he became Grand Duke of Tuscany, and deftly thwarted the Inquisition's harassment of Freemasons in Florence. Through Francois, Charles Radcliffe, who had founded the first Masonic lodge on the continent, left a durable legacy. Charles Notier and his circle. Compared to the important cultural and political figures who preceded him, compared even to a man like Charles Radcliffe, Charles Notier seemed a most unlikely choice for Grand Master. We knew him primarily as a kind of literary curiosity a relatively minor bell lettrist, a somewhat garrulous essayist, a second-rate novelist and short-story writer in the bizarre tradition of E.T.A., Hoffman and, later, Edgar Allan Poe. In his own time, however, Notier was regarded as a major cultural figure, and his influence was enormous. Moreover, he proved to be connected with our inquiry in a number of surprising ways. By 1824 Notier was already a literary celebrity. In that year he was appointed the chief librarian at the Arsenal Library, the major French depository for medieval and specifically occult manuscripts. 
Among its various treasures the arsenal was said to have contained the alchemical works of Nicholas Flamel the medieval alchemist listed as one of Schoen's earlier grand masters. The arsenal also contained the library of Cardinal Richelieu, an exhaustive collection of works on magical, cabalistic, and hermetic thought. And there were other treasures, too. On the outbreak of the French Revolution monasteries throughout the country had been plundered, and all books and manuscripts sent to Paris for storage. Then in 1810 Napoleon, as part of his ambition to create a definitive world library, confiscated and brought to Paris almost the entire archive of the Vatican. There were more than 3,000 cases of material, some of which all the documents pertaining to the Templars, for example, had been specifically requested. Although some of these papers were subsequently returned to Rome, a great many remained in France. And it was material of this sort occult books and manuscripts, works plundered from monasteries and the archive of the Vatican that passed through the hands of Notier and his associates. Methodically they sifted it, catalogued it, explored it. Among Notier's colleagues in this task were Eliphas Levi and Jean Baptiste Pitois, who adopted the nom de plume of Paul Christian. The works of these two men, over the years that followed, engendered a major renaissance of interest in esoterica. It is to these two men, and to Charles Notier, their mentor, that the French occult revival of the 19th century, as it has been called, can ultimately be traced. Indeed, Pitois' history and practice of magic became a bible for 19th century students of the arcane. Recently reissued an English translation complete with its original dedication to Notier, it is now a coveted work. Among modern students of the occult. During his tenure at the arsenal Notier continued to write and publish prolifically. Among the most important of his later works is a massive, lavishly illustrated, multi-volume opus of antiquarian interest, devoted to sites of particular consequence in ancient France. In this monumental compendium Notier devoted considerable space to the Merovingian epoch a fact all the more striking in that no one at the time displayed the least interest in the Merovingians. There are also lengthy sections on the Templars, and there is a special article on geysers including a detailed account of the mysterious cutting of the elm in 1188, which, according to the Prier documents, marked the separation between the Knights Templar and the Prier de Chaune. At the same time Notier was more than a librarian and a writer. He was also a gregarious, egocentric and flamboyant individual who constantly sought the center of attention and did not hesitate to exaggerate his own importance. In his quarters at the Arsenal Library, he inaugurated a salon which established him as one of the most influential and prestigious aesthetic potentates of the epoch. By the time of his death in 1844, he had served as mentor for a whole generation many of whom quite eclipsed him in their subsequent achievements. For example, Notier's chief disciple and closest friend was the young Victor Hugo Schoun's next grand master according to the Prier documents. There was François René de Chateaubriand who made a special pilgrimage to Poussin's tomb in Rome and had a stone erected there bearing a reproduction of Les Burgers d'Arcady. There were Balzac, Delacroix, Dumas Père, Lamartine, Mousset, Théophile Gautier, Gerard de Nerval, and Alfred de Vigny. Like the poets and painters of the Renaissance, these men often drew heavily on esoteric, and especially hermetic, tradition. They also incorporated in their works a number of motifs, themes, references, and allusions to the mystery which, for us, commenced with Saunier and Ren Le Chateau. In 1832, for instance, a book was published entitled A Journey to Ren Les Bains, which speaks at length of a legendary treasure associated with Blanchefort and Ren Le Chateau. The author of this obscure book, Auguste de la Bousse Roquefort, also produced another work, The Lovers to Eleanor. On the title page there appears, without any explanation, the motto E.T. in Arcadia Ego. Notier's literary and esoteric activities were quite clearly pertinent to our investigation. But there was another aspect of his career which was, if anything, more pertinent still. For Notier, from his childhood, was deeply involved in secret societies. As early as 1790, for instance, at the age of 10 he is known to have been involved in a group called the Philadelphies. Around 1793, he created another group or perhaps an inner circle of the first which included one of the subsequent plotters against Napoleon. A charter dated 1797 attests to the foundation of yet another group also called the Philadelphies in that year. 
In the library of Bisankin there is a cryptic essay composed and recited to this group by one of Nodier's closest friends. It is entitled Le Burger Arcadian OU Premier Accents d'une Flute Champetre, the Arcadian Shepherd sounds the first accents of a rustic flute. In Paris in 1802 Nodier wrote of his affiliation with a secret society, which he described as biblical and Pythagorean. Then, in 1815, he published anonymously one of his most curious and influential works, The History of Secret Societies in the Army. In this book Nodier is deliberately ambiguous. He does not clarify definitively whether he is writing pure fiction or pure fact. If anything, he implies, the book is a species of thinly disguised allegory of actual historical occurrences. In any case it develops a comprehensive philosophy of secret societies. And it credits such societies with a number of historical accomplishments, including the downfall of Napoleon. There are a great many secret societies in operation, Notier declares. But there is one, he adds, that takes precedence over all others, that in fact presides over all the others. According to Notier, this supreme secret society is called the Philadelphies. At the same time, however, he speaks of the oath which binds me to the Philadelphies and which forbids me to make them known under their social name. Nevertheless, there is a hint of Schaun in an address which Notier quotes. It was supposedly made to an assembly of Philadelphies by one of the plotters against Napoleon. The man in question is speaking of his newly born son, he is too young to engage himself to you by the oath of Annibal, but remember I have named him Eliason, and that I delegate to him the guard of the temple and the altar, if I should die ere I have seen fall from his throne the last of the oppressors of Jerusalem. Notier's book burst on the scene when fear of secret societies had assumed virtually pathological proportions. Such societies were often blamed for instigating the French Revolution and the atmosphere of post-Napoleonic. Europe was similar, in many respects, to that of the McCarthy era in the United States during the 1950s. People saw, or imagined they saw, conspiracies everywhere. Witch hunts abounded. Every public disturbance, every minor disruption, Every untoward occurrence was attributed to subversive activity to the work of highly organized clandestine organizations working insidiously behind the scenes, eroding the fabric of established institutions, perpetrating all manner of devious sabotage. This mentality engendered measures of extreme repression. And the repression, directed often at a fictitious threat, in turn engendered real opponents, real groups of subversive conspirators who would form themselves in accordance with the fictitious blueprints. Even as figments of the imagination, secret societies fostered a pervasive paranoia in the upper echelons of government, and this paranoia frequently accomplished more than any secret society itself could possibly have done. There is no question that the myth of the secret society, if not the secret society itself, played a major role in 19th century European history. And one of the chief architects of that myth, and possibly of a reality behind it, was Charles Nodier. Debussy and the Rosecroy. The trends to which Notier gave expression a fascination with secret societies and a renewed interest in the esoteric continued to gain influence and adherence throughout the 19th century. Both trends reached a peak in the Paris of the fin de siècle the milieu of Claude Debussy, Schaun's alleged grand master when Beringer Saunier, in 1891, discovered the mysterious parchments at Rennes le Chateau. Debussy seems to have made Victor Hugo's acquaintance through the symbolist poet Paul Verlaine. Subsequently he set a number of Hugo's works to music. He also became an integral member of the symbolist circles which, by the last decade of the century, had come to dominate Parisian cultural life. These circles were sometimes illustrious, sometimes odd, sometimes both. They included the young cleric Emile Hoffet and Emma Cave through whom Debussy came to meet Saunier. There was also the enigmatic magus of French symbolist poetry, Stéphane Mallarmé one of whose masterpieces, Lapper's Midi d'un Fawn, Debussy set to music. There was the symbolist playwright, Maurice Maeterlinck, whose Merovingian drama, Pelias E.T. Mélisande, Debussy turned into a world-famous opera. There was the flamboyant Count Philippe Auguste Villiers de Isle Adam, whose Rosicrucian play, Axel, became a bible for the entire symbolist movement. Although his death in 1918 prevented its completion, 
Debussy began to compose a libretto for Villiers as a cult drama, intending to turn it, too, into an opera. Among his other associates were the luminaries who attended Mallarmé's famous Tuesday night soirees Oscar Wilde, W. B. Yeats, Stephen George, Paul Valéry, the young André Gide and Marcel Proust. In themselves Debussy's and Mallarmé's circles were steeped in esoterica. At the same time, they overlapped circles that were more esoteric still. Thus Debussy consorted with virtually all the most prominent names in the so-called French occult revival. One of these was the Marquis Stanislas de Guaida, an intimate of Emma Cav and founder of the so-called Kabbalistic Order of the Rosecroix. A second was Jules Bois, a notorious Satanist, another intimate of Emma Cav and a friend of McGregor Mathers. Prompted by Jules Bois, Mathers established the most famous British occult society of the period, the Order of the Golden Dawn. Another occultist of Debussy's acquaintance was Dr. Gerard Incos better known as Papus, under which name he published what is still considered one of the definitive works on the tarot. Papus was not only a member of numerous esoteric orders and societies, but also a confidant of the Tsar and Tsarina, Nicholas and Alexandra of Russia. And among Papus's closest associates was a name which had already figured in our inquiry that of Jules Duanel. In 1890 Duanel had become librarian at Carcassonne and established a neo cathar church in the Languedoc in which he and Papus functioned as bishops. Duanel in fact proclaimed himself Gnostic Bishop of Mirepoix, which included the parish of Montsegur and of Alette, which included the parish of rennes le chateau Duanel's church was supposedly consecrated by an eastern bishop in Paris at the home, interestingly enough, of Lady Caithness, wife of the Earl of Caithness, James Sinclair. In retrospect this church seems to have been merely another innocuous sect or cult, like so many of the fin de siècle. At the time, however, it caused considerable alarm in official quarters. A special report was prepared for the Holy Office of the Vatican on the resurgence of cat heart tendencies. And the Pope issued an explicit condemnation of Duanel's institution, which he militantly denounced as a new manifestation of the ancient Albigensian heresy. Notwithstanding the Vatican's condemnation, Duanel, by the mid 1890s, was active in Saunier's home territory and at precisely the time that the cure of Ren Le Chateau began to flaunt his wealth. The two men may well have been introduced by Debussy or by Emma Cav. Or by the Abbe Henri Boudet, cure of Rennes Lesbains, best friend of Saunier and colleague of Duanel in the Society of Arts and Sciences of Carcassonne. One of the closest of Debussy's occult contacts was Josephine Pelletin, another friend of Papu's, and, predictably enough, another intimate of Emma Cav. In 1889, Pelletin embarked on a visit to the Holy Land. When he returned, he claimed to have discovered Jesus's tomb not at the traditional site of the Holy Sepulchre but under the Mosque of Omar, formerly part of the Templars' enclave. In the words of an enthusiastic admirer, Peladin's alleged discovery was so astonishing that at any other era it would have shaken the Catholic world to its foundations. Neither Peladin nor his associates, however, volunteered any indication of how Jesus' tomb could have been so definitively identified and verified as such, nor why its discovery should necessarily shake the Catholic world unless, of course, it contains something significant, controversial, perhaps even explosive. In any case, Peladin did not elaborate on his purported discovery. But though a self-professed Catholic, he nevertheless insisted on Jesus's mortality. In 1890 Peladin founded a new order the Order of the Catholic Rose Croix, the Temple and the Grail. And this order, unlike the other Rose Croix institutions of the period, somehow escaped papal condemnation. In the meantime, Peladin turned his attention increasingly to the arts. The artist, he declared, should be a knight in armor, eagerly engaged in the symbolic quest for the Holy Grail. And in adherence to this principle, Peladin embarked on a fully-fledged aesthetic crusade. It took the form of a highly publicized series of annual exhibitions, known as the Salon de la Rose Plus Croix whose avowed purpose was to ruin realism, reform Latin taste and create a school of idealist art. To that end certain themes and subjects were autocratically and summarily rejected as unworthy no matter how well executed, even if perfectly. The list of rejected themes and subjects included prosaic history painting, patriotic and military painting. 
Representations of contemporary life, portraits, rustic scenes and all landscapes except those composed in the manner of Poussin. Nor did Peladon confine himself to painting. On the contrary, he attempted to promulgate his aesthetic in music and the theater as well. He formed his own theater company, which performed specially composed works on such subjects as Orpheus, the Argonauts and the Quest for the Golden Fleece, the Mystery of the Rosecroy and the Mystery of the Grail. One of the regular promoters and patrons of these productions was Claude Debussy. Among Paladins and Debussy's other associates was Maurice Bars who, as a young man, had been involved in a Rosecroy circle with Victor Hugo. In 1912 Bars published his most famous novel, La Colline Inspiré, The Inspired Mount. Certain modern commentators have suggested that his work is in fact a thinly disguised allegory of Beringer Saunier and Ren Le Chateau. Certainly there are parallels which would seem too striking to be wholly coincidental. But Bars does not situate his narrative in Ren Le Chateau or any other place in the Languedoc. On the contrary, the inspired mount of the title is a mountain surmounted by a village in Lorraine. And the village is the old pilgrimage center of Shaun. Jean Cocteau. More than Charles Radcliffe, more than Charles Notier, Jean Cocteau seemed to us a most unlikely candidate for the grand mastership of an influential secret society. In Radcliffe's and Notier's cases, however, our investigation had yielded certain connections of considerable interest. In Cocteau's we discovered very few. Certainly, he was raised in a milieu close to the corridors of power his family were politically prominent and his uncle was an important diplomat. But Cocteau, at least ostensibly, abandoned this world, leaving home at the age of 15 and plunging into the seedy subculture of Marseilles. By 1908 he had established himself in bohemian artistic circles. In his early 20s he became associated with Proust, Gide and Maurice Bars. He was also a close friend of Victor Hugo's great-grandson, Jean, with whom he embarked on assorted excursions into spiritualism and the occult. He quickly became versed in esoterica, and hermetic thinking shaped not only much of his work, but also his entire aesthetic. By 1912, if not earlier, he had begun to consort with Debussy, to whom he alludes frequently, if non-committally, in his journals. In 1926 he designed the set for a production of the opera Pelias E.T. Mellison because, according to one commentator, he was unable to resist linking his name for all time to that of Claude Debussy. Cocteau's private life which included bouts of drug addiction and a sequence of homosexual affairs was notoriously erratic. This has fostered an image of him as a volatile and recklessly irresponsible individual. In fact, however, he was always acutely conscious of his public persona, and whatever his personal escapades, he would not let them impede his access to people of influence and power. As he himself admitted, he had always craved public recognition, honor, esteem, even admission to the Académie Française. And he made a point of conforming sufficiently to assure him of the status he sought. Thus he was never far removed from prominent figures like Jacques Maritain and André Malraux. Although never ostensibly interested in politics, he denounced the Vichy government during the war and seems to have been quietly in league with the resistance. In 1949 he was made a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor. In 1958 he was invited by de Gaulle's brother to make a public address on the general subject of France. It is not the kind of role one generally attributes to Cocteau, but he appears to have played it frequently enough and to have relished doing so. For a good part of his life, Cocteau was associated sometimes intimately, sometimes peripherally with royalist Catholic circles. Here he frequently hobnobbed with members of the old aristocracy including some of Proust's friends and patrons. At the same time, however, Cocteau's Catholicism was highly suspect, highly unorthodox, and seems to have been more an aesthetic than a religious commitment. In the latter part of his life, he devoted much of his energy to redecorating church's curious echo, perhaps, of Beringer Saunier. Yet even then his piety was questionable, they take me for a religious painter because I've decorated a chapel. Always the same mania for labeling people. Like Saunier, Cocteau in his redecorations incorporated certain curious and suggestive details. Some are visible in the Church of Notre-Dame de France, around the corner from Leicester Square in London. 
The church itself dates from 1865 and may, at its consecration, have had certain Masonic connections. In 1940, at the peak of the Blitz, it was seriously damaged. Nevertheless, it remained the favorite center of worship for many important members of the Free French Forces. And after the war it was restored and redecorated by artists from all over France. Among them was Cocteau who, in 1960, three years before his death, executed a mural depicting the crucifixion. It is an extremely singular crucifixion. There is a black sun and a sinister, green-tinged and unidentified figure in the lower right-hand corner. There is a Roman soldier holding a shield with a bird emblazoned on it a highly stylized bird suggesting an Egyptian rendering of Horus. Among the mourning women and dice-throwing centurions, there are two incongruously modern figures one of whom is Cocteau himself, presented as a self-portrait, with his back significantly turned on the cross. Most striking of all is the fact that the mural depicts only the lower portion of the cross. Whoever hangs upon it is visible only as far up as the knees so that one cannot see the face or determine the identity of who is being crucified. And fixed to the cross, immediately below the anonymous victim's feet, is a gigantic rose. The design, in short, is a flagrant rose croy device. And if nothing else, it is a very singular motif for a Catholic church. The two John XCIs. The dossier secrets, in which the list of Shown's alleged grand masters appeared, were dated 1956. Cocteau did not die until 1963. There was thus no indication of who might have succeeded him, or of who might preside over the Prier de Shown at present. But Cocteau himself posed one additional point of immense interest. Until the cutting of the elm in 1188, the Prier documents asserted, Shown and the Order of the Temple shared the same grand master. After 1188 Schaun is said to have chosen a grand master of its own, the first of them being Jean de Geysers. According to the Prier documents, every grand master, on assuming his position, has adopted the name of Jean, John, or, since there were four women, Jean, Joan. Schaun's grand masters are therefore alleged to have comprised a continuous succession of Jeans and Jeans from 1188 to the present. This succession was clearly intended to imply an esoteric and hermetic papacy based on John, in contrast, and perhaps opposition, to the exoteric one based on Peter. One major question, of course, was which John? John the Baptist? John the Evangelist, the beloved disciple in the fourth gospel? Or John the Divine, author of the book of Revelation? It seemed it must be one of these three, because Jean de Geysers in 1188 had purportedly taken the title of Jean II. Who, then, was Jean I? Whatever the answer to that question, Jean Cocteau appeared on the list of Shown's alleged grand masters as Jean XXIII. In 1959, while Cocteau still presumably held the grand mastership, Pope Pius XII died and the assembled cardinals elected, as their new pontiff, Cardinal Angelo Roncalli of Venice. Any newly elected pope chooses his own name, and Cardinal Roncalli caused considerable consternation when he chose the name of John XXIII. Such consternation was not unjustified. In the first place the name John had been implicitly anathematized since it was last used in the early 15th century by an antipope. Moreover, there had already been a John XXIII. The antipope who abdicated in 1415 and who, interestingly enough, had previously been Bishop of Alet was in fact John XXIII. It was thus unusual, to say the least, for Cardinal Roncalli to assume the same name. In 1976 an enigmatic little book was published in Italy and soon after translated into French. It was called The Prophecies of Pope John XCI and contained a compilation of obscure prophetic prose poems reputedly composed by the pontiff who had died 13 years before in 1963, the same year as Cocteau. For the most part these prophecies are extremely opaque and defy any coherent interpretation. Whether they are indeed the work of John XCI is also open to question. But the introduction to the work maintains that they are Pope John's work. And it maintains something further as well that John XEI was secretly a member of the Rosecroix with whom he had become affiliated while acting as papal nuncio to Turkey in 1935. Needless to say, this assertion sounds incredible. Certainly it cannot be proved, 
and we found no external evidence to support it. But why, we wondered, should such an assertion even have been made in the first place? Could it be true after all? Could there be at least a grain of truth in it? In 1188 the Prieur de Chaune is said to have adopted the subtitle of Rose Croix Veritas. If Pope John was affiliated with a Rose Croix organization, and if that organization was the Prieur de Chaune, the implications would be extremely intriguing. Among other things they would suggest that Cardinal Roncalli, on becoming Pope, chose the name of his own secret Grand Master so that, for some symbolic reason, there would be a John Xi presiding over Schaun and the papacy simultaneously. In any case the simultaneous rule of a John, or Jean, Xi over both Schaun and Rome would seem to be an extraordinary coincidence. Nor could the prior documents have devised a list to create such a coincidence a list which culminated with Jean Xi at the same time that a man with that title occupied the throne of St. Peter. For the list of Schaun's alleged Grand Masters had been composed and deposited in the Bibliothèque Nationale no later than 1956 three years before John Xi became Pope. There was another striking coincidence. In the 12th century an Irish monk named Malachi compiled a series of Nostradamus-like prophecies. In these prophecies which, incidentally, are said to be highly esteemed by many important Roman Catholics, including the present Pope, John Paul II Malachi enumerates the pontiffs who will occupy the throne of St. Peter in the centuries to come. For each pontiff he offers a species of descriptive motto. And for John Xi the motto, translated into French, is Pastor E.T. Not Near Shepherd and Navigator. The official title of Shaun's alleged Grand Master is also Not Near. Whatever the truth underlying these strange coincidences, there is no question that more than any other man Pope John Xi was responsible for reorienting the Roman Catholic Church and bringing it, as commentators have frequently said, into the 20th century. Much of this was accomplished by the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, which John inaugurated. At the same time, however, John was responsible for other changes as well. He revised the Church's position on Freemasonry, for example breaking with at least two centuries of entrenched tradition, and allowing that a Catholic might be a Freemason. And in June 1960 he issued a profoundly important apostolic letter. This missive addressed itself specifically to the subject of the precious blood of Jesus. It ascribed a hitherto unprecedented significance to that blood. It emphasized Jesus' suffering as a human being and maintained that the redemption of mankind had been effected by the shedding of his blood. In the context of Pope John's letter, Jesus's human passion and the shedding of his blood assume a greater consequence than the resurrection or even than the mechanics of the crucifixion. The implications of this letter are ultimately enormous. As one commentator has observed, they alter the whole basis of Christian belief. If man's redemption was achieved by the shedding of Jesus's blood, his death and resurrection became incidental if not, indeed, superfluous. Jesus need not have died on the cross for the faith to retain its validity.